you suddenly feel like you're part of something big. You feel like you're part of the universe. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. Using cutting-edge tools such as NSF's Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, astronomers can focus on understanding the sun's explosive behavior by observing the active region of the sun's surface and lower atmosphere as has never been possible before. We are joined by Maria Kazachenko, Assistant Professor in the Astrophysical and Planetary Science Department at University of Colorado Boulder and the National Solar Observatory, as well as a Science Working Group member at the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, who's researching how the sun stores magnetic energy and releases it as solar flares. Professor Kazachenko, thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here. So I like to start with a little bit of the background, and can you tell me about how you generally became interested in astronomy? So it's funny. Actually, the reason I became an astronomer is because uh, of the solar eclipse, which happened in 1999 in Hungary. There was a bus excursion as organized by our astronomy club, and I thought, it would be cool to travel around Eastern Europe and watch the eclipse. And I was so amazed with the whole experience that it changed my life, and I decided to pursue astronomy at that point. Fantastic. Why is it important to study the sun? That's an excellent question. So let's think about it a little bit. What are the building blocks of our universe? These are stars, right? And Sun is our closest star. And uh, as a closest star, that's one of the reasons we want to learn everything about it. So just from the fundamental science perspective, we need to understand the building blocks of the universe. And we, as you probably know, we are made out of byproducts of stars. So it's important also to understand ourselves and the stars. And then another reason to understand the st understand stars is because stars are probably to blame the, um, the existence of life on Earth. So it's important to understand our sun, uh, to understand how life appeared on Earth. So these are all kind of hand-wavy uh, science reasons to uh, to, to explain why do we need to learn about stars, but um, one of the most practical reasons to understand uh, the sun is because sun is our neighbor. And as you probably know, it's important to know what your neighbor is about, <laughs> is doing. And um, we want to understand how sun works. We want to understand how it affects us because sun is the reason why we have space weather here on Earth. And as you know, now we have so many satellites flying there in the space that any big eruption might actually very much affect us. So to be able to, to predict the space weather and to be able to be safe here on Earth electronically, uh, we need to understand what our sun is about to do. Right. And, and one of the things that I see as a question that happens a lot is, is asking about sunspots. So what is a sunspot? So historically, sunspots are just spots on the sun. Now, the question is, what's really going on there? Why the spots are dark? And as science has been developing, people actually discovered that sunspots are regions where magnetic field is strong. Now I'm throwing a new term. What's the magnetic field? Magnetic field is basically your fridge magnets. So sunspots are fridge magnets the size of Earth. Uh, they're on the sun. And so as the magnetic field is strong there, uh, the, it suppresses the, the gas pressure. And as a result, the sunspots are cooler. So sunspots are these huge areas on the sun which have strong magnetic fields which are cooler, and as a result, they look darker than the surrounding warmer areas. So sunspots are the strong magnetic field areas. Is there something that it's physically doing that makes it darker there? Or is it really just the kind of the temperature difference? Uh, yeah, it's the, basically the temperature difference that's causing, that's causing them to be dark. But the reason why, why there is this temperature difference is because that's the place where the magnetic field, which is everywhere in the sun, just pinches through the solar surface. Mm. So the magnetic field of the sun is basically this huge ball of tangled um, magnetic field ropes. And it's so tangled that sometimes it erupts through the solar surface. 
And the area where it emerges through the solar surface is the sunspot. And it's funny that sometimes there are many of this, many of these spots, sometimes there are few. There are a bunch of funny things happening on the sun with these. Is there something cyclical about it? Like, like can we think about it like you might in orbit or something? Is it something about the surface turning that does it? Like, can they be predicted? Sunspots. Ah, that's an excellent question. So we know now from historical records that the sun has this 11-year cycle, meaning that every 11 years now there is a maximum and then a minimum, a maximum and a minimum. The next maximum will be sometime from now till 2025. So now you've probably seen some news about huge solar flares in February 2024. So now we are in solar maximum. So there are lots of these sunspots. Now, why the cycle is 11 years and not 42 years? We don't know. But so it's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the rotation of the sun that causes this kind of cycle. Mm. Now, now you, you mentioned solar flares. So can we define what are solar flares? Excellent question. So solar flares are basically flares or brightenings that so we observe close to this dark area, sunspots. Now, what's causing these solar flares? We know that it's a transition of uh, uh, some kind of conversion of magnetic energy to other forms of energy. So magnetic fields, they are everything on the sun. And during the solar flare, there is this process called magnetic reconnection, which reconfigures this magnetic field ropes uh, in such a way that these magnetic fields are cut and uh, um, the sun basically, the area of the sunspot basically explodes. So the magnetic field releases this huge amount of energy. Is it possible to kind of know how big they're going to be? That's a tricky one. <laughs> so that's why basically the whole field of solar physics and people are, like me uh, have their jobs. It is extremely hard to predict how large will the next flare be. Now, we know some things uh, that, for example, big sunspots, they're more prone to host big flares than smaller sunspots. But solar physics, it's still at its birth. I would say it's like geography in the 16th century. The, we have lots of observations from this wonderful telescope from NSF and NASA and European Space Agency, but we still don't understand how big the flare would be? Will it be very small or it will be huge? Will it erupt or will it stay at the sun? These questions are fundamental and yet we have not enough knowledge to understand them. Now, you mentioned that the magneticism of the solar flare will have an impact on, say, satellites. And we had a, the recent eruption. Can you talk a little bit about what we know about how it might impact Earth if it was like a catastrophic version, what would happen? So I, I, I think there's a, a, a historic precedent that there was a big one kind of before we were really super in the electronic age. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, so solar flares are really, really important for humanity, especially in our modern age, because solar flares, they basically define what is called space weather. Now you would hear and think, wait, space weather, what's that? We know Earth weather, right? So when it rains, when it doesn't rain, when it's sunny. But what about space weather? Space weather basically is science that defines whether it's safe for satellites to be outside. And now in our space uh, space century, uh, two things are most it could affect the whole nation at once, two natural disasters. One is pandemic. And another is space weather. It is extremely important to be able to understand and predict the space weather. Now, the thing is that we are still not at the stage where we could predict when will the next big flare happen. But what we could do is we could observe what's happening right in the vicinity of the Earth magnetosphere and try to switch off the equipment uh, so that it doesn't get damaged. But now we have so many satellites uh, that might get affected, and it's really important to take measures. So I'm thinking about the kind of tools we might use to observe them, and I want to move into talking about your relationship with the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope. Can you tell me what role those kind of tools play in your research of the sun? 
So Dania Al-Ka'ino telescope uh, has been built just recently in Hawaii, and that's the largest telescope, solar telescope, if not in the universe, then for sure on Earth. The idea behind this telescope is to observe uh, the sun at highest resolution ever. Now, why would we want to do that? And the reason for that, there are so many processes, like, for example, the trigger of solar flares that we don't understand, and we need really high-resolution instruments for that. Now, Daniel K. Inui Telescope started operating several years ago, and it's still in commissioning phase, meaning that scientists are still improving and tuning and learning how it works and learning how to calibrate the data. I think this might be an interesting co concept to kind of break down for the average person. Like this process of learning how to use the instrument. Can you talk a little bit about what that might mean for someone who doesn't even understand what you're talking about in, in terms of what data you might even get out of this? Sure. So one of the reasons why you know, a telescope has been built is to understand better what's happening in the, in the sun atmosphere in terms of the structure of magnetic fields. Now, to measure magnetic fields, you cannot just stick your magnetometer in the, in the solar atmosphere. You only have remote measurements, and the only thing that you have from the sun is light. Now, the question is, how do you go from light to magnetic fields? Uh, you have to first calibrate the data. You have to remove all the noise from the atmosphere. You have to remove the crosstalk of between different instruments. This process is extremely difficult. DKIST is one of the most complex telescopes that has been ever built on the sun, on the on Earth to observe the sun. Uh, it has a huge mirror, four meters, that collects lots of sunlight. Uh, you have to make it work, and that's uh, the first thing. Such things are being done, so you have to learn a lot on the fly. Coming up, we have a solar eclipse. And its path of totality is coming over the U.S. And so people are very excited here. Can you talk a little bit about your outreach work you're going to be doing around the eclipse? So um, I'm going to lead an expedition called Eclipses and La Frontera, uh, funded by NSF Career. So thanks to NSF uh, for uh, helping uh, us out. And the idea is to bring the joy of solar science to really underrepresented communities where typically scientists don't go. To basically visit schools there, we're going for two days to local schools in uh, Del Rio, one town in another town, Eagle Pass. We're going to elementary schools, to high schools. We're bringing all the outreach activities there. We're bringing a bunch of telescopes to all these kids. We're going to teach them both in Spanish and English before the eclipse. And then during the eclipse, we'll have a stadium of up to 7,000 people where a local community uh, will join us for a solar eclipse party. And again, we'll bring, we'll bring a solar tent with a disco ball where you can see reflection of, <laughs> of the solar shadow. We'll have a bunch of telescopes and lots of activities for both adults and kids along with fun facts about the sun. So the idea is just to enjoy this wonderful and unique experience together and to learn more about the sun. Very cool. Uh, you, you said fun facts about the sun. What's your favorite fun fact about the sun? What's my, <laughs> what's my favorite fun fact? Let me think about it. Some... I guess my favorite fun fact about the sun is the following. So you know that our sun is very, very far, and it takes eight minutes for light, for a photon, to get from the solar surface till uh, Earth, right? Now the question is, how long will it take one photon to get from the solar center, which is much smaller than from here to the sun, from solar center to the solar surface? Would it take eight minutes, one minute, or... Yes. I would Probably guess less. Less than a it takes hundred thousand years. Oh, I because thought you meant the center of the, the sun. From the sun, itself. from the center of the sun. Yes, because uh, yeah, and it's very counterintuitive. And the reason for that, it's not the same photon, obviously. I confused you, but it's uh, <laughs> the sun. Get, the photon gets absorbed, caught, and then released. Caught and released. Caught and released, and mm. then it gets into this pot of boiling water, the convection zone. So this whole process gets forever. Several, uh, yeah, 100,000 years for just Interesting. to go from the inside to the outside. 
But now we understand it very well. The interior of the sun is fairly well understood in terms of this transport. Getting into the eclipse, why is that a good time to study the sun? So eclipse, historically, eclipses are are very, very rare moments where we could actually observe the solar atmosphere. The sun is so bright that typically you only see the solar surface. You don't see the super dim atmosphere. But wait, why would be inter- why would we be interested in the solar atmosphere? The reason for that is that solar eruptions and solar activity, these all happens in the solar atmosphere. And the solar atmosphere is extremely dim. It's hard to observe. And only during the eclipse we could see the solar atmosphere called corona, and then also the chromosphere, which is a little bit lower down. So only during the solar eclipse you could observe it historically. Now we have these wonderful tools. We live in the space, uh, space time. So we have uh, telescopes on ground and in space to learn about both corona and the chromosphere. So nowadays, eclipses are mostly for fun, mostly. Of course, there is some science experience, but now these days I feel that eclipses are more for joy and for outreach uh, rather than for science. But so we could still do some fun things. Is there anything in the future that you're especially excited about learning? Or yes. So, uh, so my group, we still haven't, uh, we still haven't uh, done much research with DCAST because uh, this data is really new. So now we have uh, people in my group work on it. So I'm very exciting, excited about getting new science results from there. But what I am even more excited about is uh, combining measurements from several satellites it's called so-called this multi-messenger solar astronomy combining measurements from different vantage points and from different instruments to understand not just one tiny aspect of uh, solar magnetism but the whole picture of what's going on Special thanks to Maria Kazachenko. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Podker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov. 